Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Guys, welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. I have a very special guest co-host here today. It is Amy Igus, and uh, she is here replacing Brian, who is out spending much needed time with his family. So Brian's going to be jealous about this one because I know he's interested in anthropology. I know he's a fan uh, of Dr. Anthony here, who's with us today. I'm so excited to have him on, Dr. Anthony Gustin. And one of the uh, one of the things that really picked my interest, besides the fact that he's a doctor of uh, uh, chiropractic, uh, besides the fact that he's an entrepreneur, besides the fact that he's an advocate for real food eating, um, and you know, besides all of that, besides going out with Amy to uh, the to speak about the dietary guidelines uh, back a couple of years ago, besides all that. I saw him take heat online, you know, for going and like visiting the Hadza and trying to understand kind of how, um, how, how we ate and how we lived before, you know, kind of before industrials, you know, the industrialized world. And it struck me as like so excessively critical and so unnecessary, right? That I was like, I gotta, I gotta hear this guy's side of the story. Right. I got to hear it. So we're excited to have you on here. Um, and I guess we can start start by saying, well, well, you know, before we get into that controversy, maybe. You know, what brought you into wellness space? What brought you into, you know, the kind of the health sciences? How did you find yourself there? And, you know, how did you know, how did this journey start? I mean, you went from some guy interested in wellness to let me go visit the Hadza. So I want to start with that part of the story. Yeah. So it all started back when I was young and super overweight. Um, typical kid in the Midwest growing up eating hot pockets and Doritos and all this type of stuff. And my whole family was like that extended family. Everybody in my town was like that. So I just thought it was normal until I don't even know what it was. I think it was just getting into sports, things like that, and realizing that it wasn't normal. Uh, so tried a bunch of the conventional stuff and obviously nothing worked. Similar stories. I'm sure you guys hear all the time. And so I actually went to see a Cairo PT clinic for this knee pain that I had. And they started me down this route of nutrition, health, discovery, et cetera. And from that, I dug in and knew that I wanted to help other people on that same journey as I was on. So sort of fast-tracked um, and wanted also to have my own business. My dad was a, and owns a small business himself and was always bludgeoning me in the head and told me that to never work for anybody else and, and have complete autonomy. So that was always, you know, so the, the cross-section of healthcare and owning your own business and, and Kairos, for some reason, seemed to always be very entrepreneurial. Uh, so sort of went into fast track through that. I went to some sports medicine clinics in San Francisco when I was out of school in 2012. And then realized very quickly after that, that people didn't really get better unless you addressed a lot of the underlying lifestyle choices, metabolism, like you said, um, I mean, even so, such basic stuff, I was working with a lot of pro athletes at the time. And so many of these guys just kept getting repeatedly injured and their mechanics were perfect and they're, they're the top of the, the game. But, uh, when we would clean up their sleep, stress levels, um, nutrition, obviously things like that, everything would fall into place and it would stop getting injured. So that was one of the sort of aha moments in, in my mind to sort of switch a little bit more to the whole picture, even though, you know, I knew it was a big deal, but not as big of a deal as when I started getting that clinical, um, practice. So fast track all the way through to, you know, found out there was this thing called the internet in San Francisco and wanted to help more people started writing web uh, articles, blog articles, mostly so I could stop repeating myself in my clinic and not tell the same story over and over and over again about nutrition and sleep, stress, et cetera. And just sort of took off from there and started my sort of online entrepreneurial business experience, which 
resulted in a couple of different businesses. One was called Equip Foods, another uh, Perfect Keto. So also saw low carb being something that was super um, advantageous for a lot of my patients, whether it was really high-end athletes or people that were struggling with metabolic issues. Uh, but at the time, he launched this in 2017, there was, and if anybody can remember back, back that far after the last keto wave of the last five years, that there wasn't a lot of information. There wasn't a lot of products. It was really confusing. You would Google and there would be nothing that sort of made any sense. You know, can I eat that, this or that? Like, how do I know if I'm in ketosis? All these things were really complicated. And so sort of left my clinic to focus on that business for the last five years, um, wrapped that up last year. And now I'm a small farmer. So <laughs> lots of stuff has changed, but yeah, along the way, just trying to figure out how I can have the most impact and help as many people reclaim their health as possible. Amy, I'm going to let you tackle the first question. I can already see you brainstorming there. Like the lights are going off. I know you guys met in uh, in Houston at the DGA. So um, it sounds like a story is similar to both of ours. Yeah. So, but how did you, for, there's so many points there, but how did you find yourself in Africa? I mean, and how did you, when did that come in and, and what prompted you to go there and sort of, you know, drink blood and, and eat organ, raw organ meat. And, um, and yeah. Yeah. How did you so even find yourself there? The truth to Africa has been just another part on the, you know, 20 year journey now of trying to figure out why people are so sick and, you know, so much stuff you read in books, but until you actually experience it, you don't actually learn anything. At least that's my case. That's, that's how I learned. Um, and so you can, you can understand it, but you, you don't actually know it or learn it until you experience it. And so it's one of those things where I've been fascinated with ancestral health for so long, but I've never been with the ancestral population. And so the opportunity came up, uh, my friend, Paul Saladino, you guys probably had him on before him and I had the opportunity to go over there with Eric Edmeads, uh, another guy who's doing amazing work in this space and obviously had to say yes. I mean, it's something that, that these people are also not going to be around probably for another 15 plus years. Like their way of life is already getting destroyed. And so the, the opportunity came up to, you know, Troy, you're saying how much flack I got with this one post, Matt, that, that post took off and there was, I, I don't know, 10 million impressions on it and it went pretty viral, but so many people, I said, I wanted to go see how wild humans lived obviously meaning it as a compliment to us zoo caged animals that we are now in modern civilization. And so many people took that to mean that I was racist and there's no such thing as a wild human. Um, so just to set that record straight, I wanted to see how humans have existed in their natural environment for hundreds of thousands of years, which there's only a few examples of this left in the world. So when I had the opportunity, I had to jump on it for sure. So I, I you know, I, it struck me as odd. So, you know, hearing your story, the fact that you had to put yourself through, you know, kind of the health sciences, you went through chiropractic school, you're a functional medicine doctor, you've had to build kind of, uh, you're an advocate for kind of uh, real food, low carb eating. Um, you know, it just struck me as odd that people took such, you know, uh, interest or negative, you know, they had these, like, these negative things. It's like somebody has devoted their whole life to understanding the interplay between nutrition, lifestyle, and health, right? Goes out to see, you know, a community, a tribe of people who are basically living a way that probably everybody lived 2000 years ago, right? And uh, it struck me as so odd that it was you know, I think, I don't know what they called it. It was something like, you know, fancy tourism. I don't know they use this word. It just strike me as odd. Where do you think that came from? Well, it is Twitter after all. So <laughs> I mean, you're, you're no stranger to, to the trolls there. But I think that, I mean, I, I wrote it in a way where it was more accessible to people who have never been exposed to something like this. And this is what... When I put out content a lot of times online, what I try to do is make it so people who don't already think the way I do learn something new. And I think that the scientists, uh, the anthropologists who worked their whole life to try to get their work out there and have a hundred views on YouTube and they see my posts get millions of views. I think that they jump to conclusions about my intentions and 
it's it, it's unfortunate. I mean, there's a lot of people don't, on there. Don't hate the play or hate the game. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people <laughs> on there here. I mean, what was my post scientific research? No, I never claimed it to be. And, and of course, there's much more nuance. And I even said this several times. And, and it, was, it was a tweet thread. So I don't know. It was like something like 30 tweets long. Um, but of course, I'm not an anthropologist. I never claimed to be an anthropologist. It is not published research. Of, of course, it's not. Uh, these were my observations about how humans can live and be healthy in, again, a, a natural environment. And even putting caveats of this does not mean everybody should live like this. This is just one example of humans thriving in a natural environment. I think humans are very adaptable and something I wrote in the post as well. Um, yeah, it's really unfortunate that I think a lot of people, I think took, took um, it a little too far with saying that I, you know, I was promoting companies and I was doing this. I don't even make any money from the companies that I had started before. I, I've, I've divested, I've, I sold one of them last year. I don't, I, there's just every time they tried to bring something up, I, I had, I was sort of shocked about the assumption that my intentions were to use the Hadza tribe to exploit them. Can I, can I talk to you a little bit about that? Can I talk to you a little about the hypocrisy? Because I saw, you know, several prominent scientists talk about that, right. And say exactly that, you know, Dr. Anthony, he's just, you know, uh, taking advantage of the Hadza tribe. And the person who literally, you know, liked that was Herman Ponser. Okay. Herman Ponser wrote the book, um, Burn. Have you, have you gotten a chance to read it? I, I haven't read it, but I've, I've skimmed through to look at the parts of what he was talking, which he studies the Hadza as, as well. Yeah. So this guy is literally, literally profiting off of the private publication of his book about the Hadza, right? And he was saying that, you know, this book was terrible. So I do not, guys, if you're here and listening to me, go read it just so you can expose yourself to different scientists. He has done some interesting work about metabolism over a lifetime. You know, uh, his work with John Speakman and some others was interesting. But essentially, he was criticizing you for quote unquote, exploiting the Hadza, you know, when I didn't see you make any money off it, it probably cost you money to go out there. Cost me right? a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, you know, meanwhile, he's selling a book, right. And literally profiting off of his multi-year research on the Hadza. Right. So I found it somewhat hypocritical and there were even people in the low carb community who liked those types of comments that I found, you know, who would never challenge Herman Ponser or some of these other people who, you know, literally are writing books and cashing checks. Um, how did that make you feel when, when you saw some people, even from that kind of the low carb advocate community, you know, come out and, and disagree, you know, kind of criticizing you and, and some of these people who, you know, they literally, their whole careers has been, you know, quote unquote, taking advantage of the hands of people. Yeah. I've been around and posting stuff online for long enough where I don't get bothered personally by anything. I don't really take it personally. Mm -hmm. And instead I just, and I feel bad that, and I know I expect anybody to, to agree with everything I have to say either. It's great for people to have other opinions, but when it's the negativity and the division, we, we have enough of that currently. And I think that I've just now taken the position of feeling bad for people who resort to this sort of uh, upset anger. You're bad and wrong for these things because clearly something's not going right in their life. If they if they were fulfilled and satisfied and had a great life, they would not be acting like that. Speaking of fulfilled and satisfied, right? I want to talk about that. What is it, what are those? Because you mentioned that in some of your posts about you know the Hadza. Right. Like that they are they have a they, they take it easy. Right. I, you know, that they are they are, there's there's no drama. Right. There's no there's like much less stress. Can you talk about what the actual trip itself, you know, how you came to be there, you know, uh, kind of some of the the first observations you made, how their lives are different. Can you because people are listening to this, they're like. Okay, they're just talking about some Twitter drama and some scientists who studied a tribe that don't disagree. But I don't think most people have a flavor of what it's like. Well, you know? Can I just back up just a little bit and, and ask 
for, for people that don't necessarily know what what the Hazda represents, like why why them? Why there? And did you go in with any preconceived notions of, of who they were going to be? And yeah, what did you find? it's a great question. Um, so Hadza tribe are one of the oldest hunter gatherer tribes still um, around. There's only like five or six left in the world, to my knowledge. And they are in Tanzania, but in the Lake Iasi re- region, which is like, you know, four hours nearest the biggest city, Arusha, um, in the area. And that, I mean, this is where humans are thought to have evolved. So it's one of these places where if, if they're still there after this many years, like it, th- that to me is very, very interesting. And I would love to go see many other tribes if, if I ever have the chance to do so as well, to see the variants in them. Uh, but yeah, I mean, one of the first things that we noticed when we arrived as, as far as preconceived notions, obviously I, I've heard about them before. I read a lot of studies. I had read some books to prepare to sort of just understand what other people have observed as well. But yeah, I mean, not less stress. It's almost like stress wasn't even a part of their life or lifestyle. Like the way we consider the the chronic day to day stress we have now is just completely different. Like, I, and we, we were there for I think eight days. And so it wasn't like we were on, it's nothing we were accused of, of just this tourist thing where we go and some song and dance. I don't think they were faking it for eight straight days. We were in an embedded, the, the, the guy, Eric Edmonds, I was talking about, he has gone to see this same tribe every year for the last 10 to 15 years. And so when he goes and his guests come, which Paul and I were lucky to be those guests, we actually like, we couldn't stay with them this time because of COVID, but Otherwise it's, it's essentially like we are living with them. And so it's not like they were putting on some show, which we saw often people would come in and they would do a little song and dance thing. And they would leave after an hour on their little tour bus. Now we, we were there for again, over a week. And so we, we got the full deal of how they live and yeah, I mean, stress is another one. I think that they live in, even though their hunting is being degraded and their land mass is shrinking rapidly because there's a bunch of monocrop farmers around, pastoralist herders around them. The government's pressuring them into smaller and smaller areas. They can't hunt big game. They still have this element of abundance that I haven't seen in any other population before. They can make any tool out of a knife in all their surroundings that they need at any single time. They can make a house in 10 minutes. They can, if, if anything breaks or if they have any problems, they'll fix it immediately. Like they don't, have to have any worry because they're not disconnected from nature in which they exist, which I think we have a huge problem in our society now. Like we we've abstracted it in such a way where we have to go make money. We have to specialize and do things to go make money. So that way we can give strangers our money who specialize and do stuff and get the things we need to survive. So we never had this element of security because we don't know is especially now, is the money going to go away? Is the money going to have high inflation? Is the stranger going to go away and not provide me with what I need? Is the food going to be on the shelf at the grocery store when I go? I think that's always a subconscious thing in our brain, no matter how wealthy people are. They still want more and more and more because we don't live in an environment where we, we actually have any skills. We don't live in an environment where we have a community that provides for each other. I think there's a, a lot of these things where we used to have this in smaller villages, even after our culture, stuff like this. But I think the departure from living in small communities and relying on local economies has shifted us in this always being stressed and needing more and more and more lifestyle that we see now. So very crazy tangent, but I mean, it's one of these well, things I mean, I'll, I'll, is not I'll, discussed at all. I'll, I'll disagree with you and say, you know, I know a bunch of people who hunt who still want more and more and more, you know? So, you know what I'm saying? Like they can sustain food for themselves and they have a roof over their head, but and they can go out and kill some deer and be fine, you know. Um, but do you think it's that resourcefulness that leads to the lack of stress? Or do you think they just kind of, you know, like how they say, like certain cultures, they're, they, they're so dependent on the sort of the weather, they have like 17 different words for snow, right? Like, do they even have a word for stress? Like, do they, is it they just have not internalized that stress and then that is as a result of their resourcefulness and their, that, that they can take care of themselves. And like, 
did you learn sort of anything about sort of that lack of stress and that yeah, we asked. That it, it, it's, not even, to our world? it's not even a concept that they have. Like there's not even a word for it. Yeah. Like, like, like anxiety, stress, like there, there, there are no words, there are no concepts for it. They don't even, they, just, they don't experience it, which is wild. So there's like intensity of like when we were on the hunt and killing the baboon, for example, you could call that stress, but it's not the same thing that we experience on a day-to-day basis. It's high adrenaline and intense. Mm-hmm. Same as, you know, being chased by the lion and the proverbial lion that everybody talks about with ancestral living, but it's, it's a completely different thing. And obviously you guys know that like physiologically, these are different responses as well. And so it's just interesting that they, they have no concept of anxiety, like long-term like chronic stress or anxiety. And how does that impact their lives? I mean, besides the obvious, but uh, in the longevity and. I mean, longevity, obviously they have a lot of stuff working against them in not having hospitals, having high child mortality. Uh, if they have accidents, if they break something, they're going to die likely if there's a bad fall because they don't have access to an ambulance to get to the hospital, have surgery. Like, I don't ever intend to throw the baby out the bathwater and say that all modern living is terrible and we need to go back to living like the Hadza. Uh, but only one, only one of the 40 or 50 tribe members to me, like visually looked unhealthy. Uh, she was overweight, had skin issues, just like looked lethargic. Everyone else seemed very ri- vibrant, very positive, very happy. Turned out she was with the missionaries the previous three years eating a bunch of Cetos and a gali and, and all of the snacks that they give them. And then she came back and she was basically unrecognizable to the tribe. So as, as far as the lifestyle, obviously a lot of things go into it. And this is like stress is one of them. Food, again, interacting with the environment, the amount of movement and walking they do is insane. I and mean, there's so many different variables that I'm always hesitant to pull one or two or even 10 out and say like, this is why they seem to be very healthy and live like uh, have a great li- uh, health span compared to the average American. Is it, I mean, infinite amount of variability. You know, can I, so besides, um, you know, besides uh, the lack of stress, you know, I'm curious, you know, where do they sleep? How do they sleep? You know, the, the things that we work on in lifestyle, I mean, I'm just thinking about them out loud diet, right? Diet activity and exercise, sleep, concepts of stress, mental health, right? F- feeling of community support, purpose. You know, can you walk through each one of these that you noticed out there? You know, what is their diet consist of? Right? We talked about what got them sick, which really sounds like modern processed food got one of them sick, right? But what do they, you know, what do they eat? And and can you go through these diet, activity, um, you know, how, well, not only how much they eat or what they eat, but how frequently do they eat, right? When do they eat? What time do they eat, right? Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. So again, caveat here is that they would prefer more food. And so I didn't like they, we had to hike out when we hunted the first time we went out hunting with them. We had to hike, I think it was 24 miles around trip to get one baboon when they used to be able to go out a kilometer and kill an antelope. And so their lifestyle has changed dramatically. And so I've, I observed it again. It's on their, their way of life is on the way out. And I for sure got a skewed representation of what it is, but as far as what I can describe, everyone's first preference is honey, hundred percent honey. We, yeah, we, so we hunted this baboon, killed the baboon and we're like carrying it to like this fire. We saw a beehive and some bees immediately everyone dro- they dropped the baboon ran over started a fire within five seconds the guy was screaming at me i was at the bottom of this tree he climbed up the tree started smoking the bees out and started ripping out the combs and throwing them down and i was just like catching comb after comb of this honey and then everybody was grabbing it and ravenously eating it that's how they treated honey just to you give think, you perspective for, compared you, to the to me do you think it's the sweet taste do you think it's the you know, what do you think is driving that? Yeah, I think it's, it's likely the density of energy that they don't, 
they don't have an enormous amount of energy that is available to them. So especially in there, like not being, I mean, you think that they're like sitting there eating it because it has energy or because it tastes awesome. Well, I think it tastes awesome because it has energy and that's the way our, our bodies were programmed to be able to consume energy, to be able to survive longer periods of time in more scarce environments. And the, I I'm sure it, it would be different if they were able to hunt hippos, which is like their preferred food is fatty animals. They, they like have these stories about hunting hippos, for example. Uh, but that stuff they eat now is incredibly lean. And so they're only eating protein. Of course, they're going to try to get as much energy as possible in the form of carbohydrates. That's all that's available to them. Like they, they essentially have no access to fat, period. So yeah, they get into extreme, just ravenous mode when they, when they, Inter- interact with the honey. And I, I saw it two different times because basically like hitting a jackpot. They, they don't know where these hives are going to be. They're wild bees. And so they swarming around and yeah, it was um, even asking them afterwards. And this is even in a bunch of research as well, that er- both men and women prefer honey over everything else. And then it's meat and the way they eat the meat, which is I, something that I've always been into and have done way more since I've had a trip there is, over open fire. Uh, and so, I mean, obviously they don't have any other way to cook, but they cut it into, it's always liver first. And so butcher the animal, cut out the entrails, feed it to the dogs and then liver immediately. Every animal, every time they cook is a liver immediately. And they cut, cut it into little bite-sized things and share it around. So it's not like how much do they cook that liver? Because I growing up, I, it's funny. We used to eat raw liver, it, um, nearly raw liver, you know, they would eat the liver would probably besides the brains, which was cooked a lot, but, um, like that's a middle was, Eastern delicacy, you know, and Amy's like, what, <laughs> you know, it's like a, it's a middle Eastern kind of delicacy to eat raw liver. So I'm just, I'm just curious, like a Lebanese cuisine, if everybody knows that not all the time, but, it would be like on occasion, it would be raw liver, you know? Yeah. They, they cooked it all every time. I mean, it was, it was pretty cooked through. I have photos of it. Um, I don't know if anywhere on the, the Twitter thread, but yeah, it's, it's a, a very cooked through. Um, and then after that, basically like everything was, they make little skewers or they have throw the animal fully on the fire and then take it off and eat it. And I would say more like more raw than I would say more meat, like medium rare to rare is how the temp of the meat would be. Uh, but yeah, it's just very slow and communal when they eat everything else besides the honey. The honey is just- How quickly do they eat? Like how quickly are they eating? Because there's some people who say obesity is due to the speed of which you eat. So when you saw them eat that honey, how quickly do they eat it? They could not eat that honey any faster, humanly possible. There's no way. But with the meat and everything else they ate, even fruit and some other things that we had, berries, it was like a light snacking. It was like a very slow, wait your turn sort of thing. And yeah. the meals would take three to four hours. So again, these Paul and I, and some of the people that we're with, were like, I would say we're, we're pretty metabolically fit humans. And we, at this point, we're going like three or four days of eating like a very small amount of food. And then granted, these guys' frames are, are much smaller than ours as well. But even still, like they, they're clearly hungry. They go out this whole way. When they're having the meal, it's a very slow, very methodical, very communal way of eating. And it's with, like adding the fire in is like all these, it, the entire process is very ritual based. And so the person who killed the animal starts the butchering process as someone else is starting the fire. Then everybody gets seats around the fire and then everybody starts coming together. And then the person again, who killed the animal generally is the one who serves people. And then he'll go around with a knife. And it seemed like in in order, like in a clockwise order, not that that means anything, but again, there's just this ritual to it. And then it was usually the other organs, then the larger cuts. And then after that fire would still be going, they would keep adding to the fire and then they'd play music. They have all these random instruments that they've made or stuff that they've bought. And then after that storytelling, every single meal, not only like dinners and after hunts, but like every, every meal is like that. And the men and the women are separate and they each have their own fire. 
And it's about the same sort of cadence of what they would do at each dinner time. Did you have any idea why the men and women are separate? It was the the entire time we were there. It was that they were separate, and it seemed like they liked it that way to have their their own separateness. Uh, and they both have respect and reverence for each other across genders. And this is another thread that I was working on. I want to see how how canceled I get if I post about my gender observations of the Hadza. But uh, <laughs> I'd be for careful sure, for sure. Um, how do you know that they were gender. men and female? Uh, good question. We we actually asked about if you know what they thought about genders and what they thought about um, sex transition or if people could be any other genders and they were it seemed almost offended at those questions like they seemed like really troubled and bothered. Which not to say that every human needs to do that that that's right or wrong but it was just an observation that I had. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was like, I'm, I'm curious if they have any concept of gender fluidity, like is common now. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that they probably perceive very differently or maybe not even exposed to compared to uh, modern living. Um, so, so the genders are separate. Do they eat different foods? So the, when there are smaller hunts, the women basically get the leftovers. And so then they make, and we, we asked the women about this. They're like, hey, are you upset that you don't get the food first? The men eat first? And their response was, no, we prefer that because then the men are strong and go out and hunt and get more food. Yeah. So there yeah. is some like gender identity there, you know? Yeah, for sure. And they each have specific roles and the women would make broth, like broths out of the bones other roots uh, and bo- both of the genders, I mean, they, they have to also supplement with Ugali now because they can't hunt as much as they want. And so they're, they're eating some amount of cornmeal at this point daily. So it's unfortunate, but again, if they were to be able to, they would only eat anything that they could thrive on, but they. How do they get cornmeal? Missionaries come and bring it to them. Oh, wow. And is the the lack of hunting ability is because like civilization is encroaching on their territory? Yeah, exactly. Okay. The women are not involved in the hunting at all. No. I mean, it's very much like hunter gather, men hunt, women gather, like very, very clear boundaries between those two things. What happens if you you're female and you want to hunt, you know? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I got another question. How frequently do they eat? Two times a day, max. Yeah. And the other times, like, for example, at, it's usually like in the afternoon or evening after like a hunt or a day where they have an animal or stuff like that to eat. And then that's when they make the yogali if they want or the broths or whatever. And then otherwise it's like very, very small amounts. Like the day after we had the baboon, we got to camp at sunrise and the, some guys were like cooking up the brain and eating the hands and like some of the leftover parts, but it was like very small amount. Sometimes like it was when we were driving back, we had berries and they ate like a handful of berries in the middle of the day. It was like, if they snack, it's, it's like maybe a hundred calories max. Otherwise I'd say like one larger meal a day. So they're basically one meal plus whatever they can find along the way. Yeah. But it's like, but for example, like they could, there was an abundance of roots and an abundance of baobab, which are these little fruit pods around them. And even though they could eat all of that, they didn't eat it. Why? I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know if it's just a conservation thing. If they're, if they know that the meat's going to come later, I kind of, I don't know what it is, but they, yeah, it's not like they're, it's, it's not like they're only eating what they can get because they could have, they could be gorging all day long, given the, what we saw. Was there any point where they didn't eat for, for an extended period of time, like two days or something like that? Or that's not rare. That's not common. It's not common. And then um, what about their sleep? So this is where do they sleep? How long do they sleep? Do they nap? 
sleep and water are two things that I've thought a lot about since that trip. We'll, we'll talk about sleep first, just because, you know, it's this thing that I think everybody seems to be over optimizing for and must get perfect eight hours of sleep room, very dark, this specific temperature, no interruptions, excellent of deep sleep, or you're going to die basically is what everybody's saying right now. Like every sleep researcher is talking about how dangerous it is to go even one night without eight hours plus of sleep. Is that really the case when, even when thinking to when I go camping or when I'm doing stuff like that, I never get a lot of sleep because there's always stuff going on and the sun rises. It's not completely dark out ever. So they have these little huts basically and they sleep in the ground, which is obviously not comfortable. They hear other people talking and moving around. So they're up all the time and they get up during the night for an hour or two. Then they go back to bed. And I'd say probably on average, like, and I'm sure some anthropologists will butcher me because my observation is, was not throughout a course of the entire lifetime, but yeah, I would say maybe five to six hours total and not in one chunk, of course. And there's this guy, Alex Guzzi, who's been writing a lot about sleep stuff. And he, he took Matt Walker's first chapter of his book and tore it apart, talking about how he's basically misrepresented all of the research in it. And which is a why we sleep book. I'm sure you guys have heard of, and he's now writing a lot about how it's probably beneficial to not sleep as much, just like it's beneficial to not go or to go without food and fast every now and then. His argument is it's also probably ideal to restrict yourself to sleep every now and then. And I think this makes sense with a lot of stuff in nature where there's probably some benefit to it. Do I know? Of course not. I don't have any research to back that up, but it's just interesting to me to think about that have the experience of obviously whenever I sleep outside, which humans have done for hundreds of thousands of years, what this tribe has done, no one's getting eight plus hours of sleep. No one has a completely controlled environment, period. I, I just find but the level of stress is low. And if they wanted to sleep, they could just go and sleep at any time. Uh, yeah, they take not necessarily like sleep naps during through the day, but like they certainly rest throughout the day where they'll just like hang out and lie there and do nothing for you know an hour or two at a time but they're not like snoring asleep sort of thing you know what i mean they're just hanging out uh and i've actually sort of experimented with this a little bit over the last couple of weeks uh moved out to this farm outside of austin full-time a couple of weeks ago and i've been spending way more time outside and i found that restricting my sleep to like six and a half seven hours a night max i'm my energy level through the day is so much better. So just an interesting observation that I'm getting right now. Yeah, I don't know how long it's could going to last. Could also be sleep timing, right? So we know that sleep, the sleep cycles are usually about a one and a half hour. So if you were, you know what I mean? Like if you're waking up. It could be a lot up, of things. Could, no? Yeah, it could, could be a, an enormous number of things. But it's just, I, I find it interesting that my, whatever tracker tells me I'm going to have a terrible day because I didn't get whatever I'm going to sleep but I feel great. So yeah, I, I know I just, that's an interesting thing as well as the water that th they basically never drink water ever. I like, I, again, we were with them for seven, eight days and I saw them drink water twice. One was after this 24 mile, basically hike slash run that we went on where we were sucking down bottles of water, like, like animals. And they, they like calmly dug into this Creek bed and started drinking this dirty water out of the Creek bed that filled up. And then another time was like, when we were going out to hunt, they had this like very clear thing that they knew where it was, but I had like kind of shells or cups next to this tree that had a hollowed out thing that collected water, but just a little sip. And they were on their way. That was the only time I saw them drink water in eight days. Wow. So again, the whole drink a gallon a day of water for blah, blah, blah. Like, okay. <laughs> really? Do, do, do we need that? Just, I don't know. It just makes me think and question a lot of these things that I've like, I've questioned literally everything in health, nutrition, et cetera. But these are two things after staying with them, I'm like, wait a second, I haven't questioned 
sleep and water enough because this is just, and maybe it's all just some weird thing that I saw and totally not optimal and it's terrible for them. I don't know, but it was just an interesting observation that I have that makes me think a little bit more that I hadn't before. Um, I'm curious to know how, you, like, what the impact has been on your life. You talked a little bit about a, a career transition now that you're you're back and you're farming, and I wonder if that was part of the result of that trip, and and also like how has all everything that you saw and learned changed your life and changed your career and changed the way you you work with people. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So we went last February, says so 14 months ago, and I'd say I'm still integrating stuff from it, and I'm still like man, like that, my life has changed because of this exposure to this, to this tribe. And I think a lot of it is just trying to find a lifestyle where I'm outside way more and using my hands and interacting with nature. And I was already on that path to some degree. I think the more the so I've seen this with plenty of other people at this point, but this sort of, you keep pulling threads and health, you get nutrition, functional medicine stuff metabolic health, these four pillars that you talked about, sleep, lifestyle, all these factors, then the community, emotional health, mental health, then you just keep pulling and you get to with most physical health. And I think emotional mental health, this root of us being removed from nature is just destroying everything. And, uh, also just with nutrition, looking at like where our food comes from, soil, et cetera, regenerative agriculture is like such a fascinating thing to me. Cause I was always already interested in that. And I've seen so many other people in the health space, like, okay, like if we don't figure this out and if we don't figure the soil out, we're not like, none of this is really going to matter. And so I think that among like a lot of other exposure books I've been reading, things like that, I've gotten like really wanting to go back to living, not like the Hods up per se, but to the point over the last four years, especially, I mean, even when I was in my clinic, I was inside all day long until I had time where I was going outside specifically to do things. And I want to flip that. And so I just kind of want to create a life for myself where my day to day, I, I have to go outside to do things. My work is outside. So it's just kind of a personal choice of like seeing them living in paradise, essentially what, what they consider to be paradise. And I'm sort of trying to approximate that myself. And I think Paul did the same thing. Actually, on the way back from the Hadza trip, we had the storm in Texas, so we couldn't get back. And so Paul and I rerouted and went to Costa Rica. He's a big surfer, snowboarder. And he basically, he just stayed there. <laughs> now he just lives there. And it's kind of the same thing. We're like, we're like, both of us had this moment when we were there talking about it, like, why don't we live basically live out like create lives where we are living outside? Like why like being inside on a computer all day long is like, it's kind of ironic. Cause like you need to do that to be able to have the life where you can then be outside. And I, I think Paul and I have done a lot of work over the last five, six years and are sort of like trying to create this lifestyle for ourselves. There's a lot of trade-offs to it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's something that's really important to me now moving forward. You talked about how they have a sense of like that they live in paradise. Do they, is that something that they've expressed? Like, do they, do they have a sense of like that there's a world outside of their tribe and their environment and that they really are lucky and that the rest of us are sort of insane for living yeah. the way that we live or is it they're not, they don't have that level of self-consciousness. So there are small villages I don't know, 20 kilometers away from where they're living that are disheveled. And those, these people are in poverty. Hods are not. Hods are very rich. They're a very rich lifestyle. And they, they believe that. But the people that have like basically taken, eaten any bit of the apple of civilization are struggling and are in extreme poverty. And so like most of them have been to those places once a month. And then a lot of, because there's other tribes that they trade with and do stuff with. And then a good bit of them have gone to Arusha, which is the city nearby for whatever reason, or a missionary brings them or whatever. And they hate it. They do not like it. And yeah, they're very intentional about what they want to spend their time with, which for the men is hunting. And for the women, it's basically doing a lot of creative stuff. So they, they, for example, barter by making necklaces and bracelets and things like that, and then sell them to, or trade them for other things like arrowheads, stuff like that. And so they just want to 
basically hunt and be creative and make things and be outside and not live indoors. And they, they express this. So it's funny you say like, uh, creating this life and, you know, I've seen, uh, some Paul's, uh, Paul's videos where he's, I don't know, you know, outdoors doing archery on a farm, who knows what. Right. And it's funny. My, my version of that is like, shit, I want to get a gym. Oh crap. Sorry. Sorry, Jack. Uh, I cursed, but I want to get like a, you know, metabolic health clinic with, uh, you know, resistance training. And I mean, we certainly, if I could, have a farm where you can help tow, you know, dig up some soil and stuff like that. If that was practical for my environment, I'd do that. But I think the next, next closest thing would be flipping tires and, you know, smashing, uh, uh, you know, a hammer, you know, against it and kind of lifting heavy things and doing, doing things indoor and outdoor. Um, you know, so I, I share that, that, you know, uh, you know, kind of, uh, this idea of like, you know, I want to be outdoors, work my hands. And, you know, there's pretty good data to show even things like walking out in nature that, you know, reduces cortisol levels, blood pressure. I mean, it's, it's, so there is this disconnect that we've all had, you know, especially look at us all now, you know, Amy and I, we've been on zoom all day helping patients. And uh, uh, here we are on a zoom podcast, right. Uh, in the last two years, more than ever, we've been so um, tethered to the desk, right? Tethered to the desk. So it's you know it's uh, it's refreshing to hear that somebody's trying to get out of that, get out of that cage. And I'm I've never I try to be prescriptive, and I don't want to tell anybody how they want to live. This is just what I found I want for myself that I'm trying to make. And if people like screens, they like being inside. They want to enter the metaverse. Great. Like, please do whatever you want to do. This is just what I found on my journey and where I'm at now. And maybe that'll change in the future, but that's just where I'm at now. Yeah. It's interesting that the, the things that they occupy their time with are the things that we do as pastime activities. Like you said, you talked about earlier, how we work every day, all day inside on screens to be able to, you know, be outside to spend time painting or crafting or, you know, doing yeah. and cooking and hunting. Playing um, music. And, yeah. And this is what they are doing and that's what their focus is. And they're so much happier. Yeah. yeah. And they don't even have a word for stress. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. So, okay. So uh, what happens next? So you mentioned you were an entrepreneur. We didn't really hit that, but I'd love to just hear about that because, uh, you know, my wife's an entrepreneur in the space and I'm always interested in what kind of drives people to, you know, uh, so you're the owner of perfect keto. That's right. Or. Yeah. I sold the business last year. So I was the owner no longer. Got it. Okay. So how did you go from, all right, let's go visit the Hadza. I'm inspired. You know, I lost weight. I'm going to go talk at the DGA, you know, to let's make a company, you know, that's because that's a transition most people don't understand. Let's go, you know, start up a regenerative farm. You know, like how, how does how does the entrepreneur because people criticize the entrepreneurial side when doctors or you know uh, uh, healthcare professionals, chiropractors, when we delve into any sort of business venture. So I'm just curious in the next you know couple of minutes if you could talk about how you got started with that and have you faced any criticism over it. I get, yeah. I get lambasted every day that my wife, you know, wants to make uh, almond flour and monk fruit cookies, right? Like that's, a, this is a world travesty that a doctor's wife wants to, you know, take people away from Oreos and give them almond flour and monk fruit based cookies. This is like the, how could I do that? You know, how could I be married to that she. person? Yeah. What? How dare she? Yeah. Oh man, it's wild. Yeah. I think that so it, it goes back to, a time I do pretty rigorous, like monthly, quarterly, yearly reviews, just to assess where I'm at in life, where my goal is at, where I want to head, where I've been, et cetera. And just thinking about wanting to help more people. And I had five locations at that point in my clinic. And I was like, if I see, I mean, we, we are like very high touch. So we'd only be able to see like eight to 10 people a day, uh, maybe 12. And I was like, okay even if I have 30 locations, like what's the number of people that I could help in a year or during my entire career? It's like, wow, this number is pretty low. Um, and so I was thinking about 
ways where I could just help more people and solve bigger problems. And it's funny because I've kind of gone back the other direction after doing that. And I think, you know, we, we did a really good job. I think making a dent in the low carb keto space and helping people transition to much healthier lifestyle. Uh, we, for example, wrote thousands of articles and you had, you know, time I left the business over 200 million page views, uh, which is like a, just a lot of eyeballs on content that I think was done with a really great um, standard and really, we had a really phenomenal editorial team. And so that's really important. Uh, and I think people should be thinking about that, but I also miss working on a local level and impacting people one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, all the people that we helped, I didn't connect with anybody basically, maybe at conferences, things like that, but there was no face-to-face -face interaction. Like I was working with patients and now I'm sort of like going back to doing that with my, with the farm. Like I want to sell stuff locally. I don't think I'm going to be at farmer's markets, but we're going to do events here and do that type of stuff and sort of reconnect back to a community. But yeah, I think it's mostly just the drive to think about how can I solve interesting problems? And I think that that just, sometimes I wish I could shut that part of my brain off, but I can't. And the blessing and the curse to think like that all the time, of just like what problems exist and how can I solve them? Uh, and I think that in the beginning of the, I don't know, my, my journey in doing this, I think a lot of it was driven by ego and achievement, success. And I think over a lot of personal work that's stripped away and now I just find it fun um, and try to leave that stuff on the sidelines. I mean, what is it like to grow a company, you know, and sell it? It's got to feel like, a, you know, somebody talk, took a baby. Talk, talk about stress, man. <laughs> God. Yeah. The, the yeah. odds, I don't have words for what the experience was like. Obviously, it was great at the end, but probably shaved a bunch of years of my life. It was, it was brutal. It was a tough journey. Uh, especially like the last couple of years is very hard. Uh, learned a lot for sure. Learned a lot, like developed a lot of skills, but burned myself out, got extremely depressed, was suicidal for a while. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it wasn't, I would say a natural response to living like a human. And you know, when you sell it, how do you know that somebody's going to have your same values? You know, that's a big, that's a big deal. Well, yeah, we discussed a lot of it and I knew the person that was going to acquire it also have in there in the agreement of product standards of like, Hey, you can't put this in products. You can have these and you know, only so much of that you can push forward. But at the end of the day the I think the business was at a point where it was, I like to start things and build things. And it was at a point where it needed way more optimization and professionalization. And I just wasn't the right person to continue moving it forward and growing the business. Yeah. And so yeah, I think that they've done a really great job since then about expanding things and, and continuing on what we had started. Uh, but yeah, of course, there's always uh, risk. There's been some other people who have sold some health companies in the past who hasn't worked out well. So I've learned from their mistakes and tried to, to do it as best as I could. You know, it's funny. Uh, um, people don't realize how hard it is to be kind of a small business owner. You even said, you know, it wasn't even that lucrative. If you could have gone back, would you still do it for sure. I, I never like to play the game of, you know, changing anything in my life. I, I, I like where I'm at and it's all part of the journey. And I think that with any up, with any up and any down, there's something to learn. And I like what I've learned and yeah, I'd probably be making the same mistakes in the future. If I haven't made them in the past, what are you eating now? How frequently you eat and where can people find you? How frequently do I, I again, it's this change. I was, what, I took another work project from like October to April and I was eating pretty regularly breakfast, lunch, dinner, sort of standard, standard thing. And I was very hungry all the times and eating the same type of food I'm eating now, which is mostly meat, some fruit, random vegetables. Um, and now that I'm out here and spending all this time, Wait, I didn't hear honey. Hold on. I didn't hear honey. I, honey, I actually just harvested a, like six gallons from our hives. We have 11 hives here. Um, so I have, I have too much honey right now. Um, I so. haven't, I haven't ate honey in over 10 years. Am I missing out? It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Amy, when was the last time you had honey? Uh, at, at least seven years to eight years, probably. Um, yeah. I don't, I'm not, I'm not sold on the honey yet. I'm not sure I'm going to be 
sipping that. So, so very, close, very interesting you know? thing. Actually, when we were in Tanzania, the I had until that point been very strict keto for like four or five years, and I was wearing CGM, and anytime I had stuff like honey or fruit, it would spike my levels like crazy. And then I just started eating a lot of fruit when I was there because that's basically all they had was meat and fruit. And so I was just eating it a bunch. And then I just, I felt pretty good. And so I kept doing it. I'm like, okay, let's, let's put a CGM on me now that I'm back and eating carbs and like, like this for the next, and I was eating honey. I was eating all this stuff. That was like a month or two later. My response, my blood sugar response now is like totally flatline. I don't know if you guys have seen this people are like, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they habituate time. back Reactive. to carbohydrate, you know, like a modest amount. Like, would you say it's 100, 200 grams in a day? Yeah, yeah, something like 150 grams a day, probably. Yeah, so it's still low ish carb, just not strict. I don't know how you could eat more than that. <laughs> like, honestly, if you're eating real food, I don't know how you can eat more than that. Yeah. yeah, so that's the thing. But the average American, you know, what does the DGA say? The DGA says, you know, 300 grams of carbohydrates is fine, maybe even 400, right? which is kind of astronomical. It's wild. Um, but yeah, to get back to your question, after being inside a lot, I haven't eaten today. And like at last couple of weeks, I've basically maybe a light something midday. If I'm just basically like very ravenous, I've been doing a lot of work outside, but other than that, it's been doing one big meal at the night. I don't think anybody could pay me to eat honey, Amy. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> you know, I, I don't need any reason to eat. Like that signal, like that you said about the Hansa, that's like, that's like nothing. That's chump change. You know, I, you know, I would, I think I would climb that, you know, I would, I wouldn't even smoke the bees out, you know, and that's just how go straight in. I'd go straight in. So, you know, I keep the honey at bay. <laughs> Maybe uh, I'll send you like a, a one ounce jar of honey from our hives. What it's That's like, it. just kind of trigger me. So <laughs> well, well, that way it'll, it'll limit you. We'll, we'll set some boundaries. You can't go too crazy. The problem is we're limited to that one ounce jar, but then we have seven elevens on every corner here. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a quick, quick route. Yeah. My, awakening that hunger. My wife jokes around. She's like going to make this jar where I have to, uh, step on a scale to to open the jar she jokes with me you know she's joking she's like i'm gonna develop a bluetooth because she knows we use like bluetooth scales and stuff like that and wi-fi equipment uh to kind of remotely monitor people she's like i'm gonna come up with a bluetooth scale that opens up you know the honey jar that's very smart the honey part so anyway um how do people find you just Search my name, everything will come up. Anthony Gustin, anywhere. My handle is on all social media, dr Anthony Gustin. Um, you still yeah. see patients or not really? Nope. Um, but I do have a podcast, I have an email newsletter. It's where I put most of my information out. And then, yeah. Uh, oh, Joyfield Farm is the name of our farm that I'm literally just starting it up right now. So if you guys want to figure out what I'm doing there, I have some really interesting things going on. I'm going to do some experiments with chickens and pigs and stuff like that, trying to produce the healthiest animals. We're going to do a lot of nutrient testing and give them different feed, try to do a lot of low PUFA animals. And so check it out. So that's Let me, let, let's get some one, one liner on, uh, I gotta be honest with you. I've looked at, uh, I've looked at the data, you know, for PUFA and I think we can have a whole nother hour discussion on it. Um, do you eat, do you eat nuts? I do not. So you're not. Yeah. When was the last time you had any nuts? Like four days ago. <laughs> I, mean, oh, I, don't like okay. eat, I don't avoid them like the plague or anything like that. But yeah, I mean, it was in something else I was eating. You know, like, yeah, whatever. I'll eat it. But uh, I don't choose to eat nuts. Got it. Okay. Even a raw macadamia nut. Macadamia nut. I think it was an exception. Obviously, is like three percent linoleic acid in macadamia nut compared to a walnut, which is like seventy percent. Got it. Okay. So you'll go for macadamia nut. Uh, so tro tropical nuts and tropical fruits, very different than high latitude. And I actually did a presentation I could send you if you want to check it out on this stuff. Sure. Brazil nuts, Brazil nuts, medium. medium Got it. Medium. Yeah. What, right. why are you what about, no, no, I'm just curious. You go to a restaurant. Okay. You order whatever. You're not sure if they glazed it with an oil. I don't do that. You won't eat it. I have like two restaurants that I go out to eat in Austin and one doesn't use any vegetable oil and the other one know, know me by 
the oil as the oil guy and they cater the menu and can modify stuff to me. But yeah, I, I, my pitch at restaurant is, Hey, I have a sensitivity to any liquid fat. Uh, just let me know if there's any, if it's any of the foods, if I can just do it without, that'd be great. And if you can't do it, that's fine. Let's order something else. Yeah. That's about where, that's about where I'm at. Except maybe, uh, maybe a little bit more tolerant of the nuts, you know, what, what's the, what, yeah. What the, what's the overall, um, stance for you on, on Puva? I, I, think, I would never add oil to anything I ate. Yeah. I would never add a, you know, if I, if, if I was going to cook with oil, it would be avocado oil. I don't even trust most olive oil personally. I don't trust most olive oil. So, uh, you know, it's cut, uh, but I don't, I rarely would add any oil, you know, or any added fat at all. MCT oil, butter, I rarely use at all. You know, if I was going to use a fat for like when my wife cooks, she uses butter, you know, if I'm going to fry up something and I want the pan to be a little, you know, uh, a little greasy. I'll put some avocado oil on it. Uh, but I, I don't like the concept of adding fat from a, yeah. from a perspective, like it just makes me eat more. Why would I, you know, I don't want to eat more. Right. Interesting. You know, um, I, I probably should mention some of that latest work project I was talking about. It's called zero acre. Um, and we're doing, we're trying to make an alternative to vegetable oils and seed oils. And we're, we actually got the same team that built all that perfect keto content base, that 200 million page views, crazy editorial team. And then we added a bunch of other researchers that are helping us write these crazy definitive papers right now. We just posted the first one on obesity and the role of PUFA and linoleic acid in obesity. Um, and so I know that obviously there's a lot of talk about carbohydrates role, et cetera, but I think that there's an untold story. Yeah. I saw some interesting data, like just you know, swapping out soybean oil for olive oil improves, you know, insulin sensitivity. I think it's a double hit really like the processed carb and the, yeah. I'm not sure what it is. I mean, if it's truly, I don't know what it is. So you're, are you like cold pressing, you know, like rapeseed? Is that like the idea or what do you? No, there's no, there's no seeds involved. Um, well, we're going to launch a product in a couple months here, uh, but keep it under wraps for now. But, uh, the, I'm most excited about using this as a education tool, much like we did with perfect keto. So the white paper that we just published, um, about obesity, it's like 45 pages long. And we had several scientists and a who reviewed it. Really respect. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tuck, so Tucker Goodrich and Rafi Sertoli were sort of the primaries on it. And then we even had Gary Taubes rip it apart and a bunch of other people like that. So, uh, there's been a lot of eyes on it. If you guys want to check it out, if you have any feedback, we're happy to make edits and change it as well and have a sort of change order on it. But I'm super excited to at least start having a conversation about the role in bringing together like a central place that all this content's in. Cause the same thing with keto, this didn't exist five, six years ago for keto. And I would say we did a really good job pulling it together and creating the flywheel of education. So people actually knew what the hell was going on. And the same thing with, I think seed oils, PUFA, vegetable oils, and stuff like that, where there isn't a central source, the science isn't collected anywhere. And so we're in the process of publishing all these white papers to hopefully convince people like you, um, that it is way more damaging than I think a lot of people credit and then hopefully help people a lot and just make decisions around how to eat out at restaurants and how to make changes in their life as well. So super excited I'm, about that. I'm, I'm convinced, you know, I, but I'm, well, I should tell, I should back that out. If you look at the fat biopsy data, if you look at data, you know, from generally healthy Northern European countries that have minimally higher, you know, omega-6, you know, uh, concentrations in their blood or in their fat, you know, there's some discordant data, right? Like it's improved, it shows that it's associated with improved uh, mortality. I'm just not convinced for any reason why I would choose vegetable oil over avocado oil other than maybe cost. Right. And I, I can't, I can't bring myself to use those oil over avocado. I'm fortunate enough that I can get avocado oil and use it rarely, even if at all. Right. I can get meats, you know, I can go to places that don't, don't use those things. Um, I, 
you know, I even get nauseous. I told Amy about this. Remember when we talked about going to the Chinese food? Like I had, I used to be addicted to Chinese food. When I go to a restaurant now with Chinese food, I literally cannot even, I don't know what it is. It's not like a thing. Like, you know, um, the smell of the oil is just yeah. makes me nauseous now. Uh, but I, you know, I wonder what effect eating, you know, nuts has on any of this, right. Or if it matters at all, you know, um, for most people at least. Yeah. I mean, eggs, for example, have a high amount of linoleic acid, but they have these things called hydroxylates in them that block the oxidation. Nuts have high amounts of vitamin E. Like there's obviously in real food forms, it's likely very different. Nuts for me, it's just the, the prevalence of both carbohydrate and fat together in a food source. It's like the only, the only things that, that exist in nature is like, is dairy milk. Yeah. Dairy and nuts. And those are very intentionally made by nature to, to make people eat fat or grow or prepare for winter or grow as humans or, or other animals, mammals. So do that reason. I think just that logic, I'm like, and every like ice cream, like French fries, like every, every food that people usually go nuts for is that combination of carbohydrate and fat. I think for a reason, like the hods are chowing down that honey ravenously. I think it's the same, same reason we want. Like our, and the fatty meat, right? They're, right. They, they want fat. I'm sure if you gave them fatty meat and honey, they'd be very happy. Oh yeah. Drizzle, honey drizzle on top of the meat. Yeah. Yeah. Do they do that? I don't think they. Because my son, my, you know, three, when my son was three, he dipped bacon into maple syrup at the diner. Exactly. Right. And so, I mean, it's like basically like, you know, uh, telling you that signal, right. They're after right. that, that foraging signal that comes from food reward. That's a combination of carbs and fat. You know, it, you know, what's worse about safflower oil and some cottonseed oil. There's some data that I've shared with Tucker. It actually prevents the release of GLP one. Right. So when you take a carbohydrate and you pair it, like, like the French would pair a starch, high quality starch and butter right? You still maintain most of your GLP, right? If you do that with olive oil or lard, you still maintain the release of GLP, meaning like, you know, uh, it's not as potent as, you know, uh, it's not as potent as if you had um, just the fat alone, but you still maintain some when you combine the two. But if you take safflower oil, for example, there's just no GLP released at all, which means you're basically hungry two hours later, right? And it worsens insulin resistance, right? They did this, this group, this intervention of replacing soybean oil with, um, with uh, uh, olive oil, right? Uh, and just that intervention alone improved A1C in pre-diabetics, right? So it was a small study done by the olive oil company, but I, I, I believe it because I've seen similar results, mm. right? When somebody has fried food, like French fries, their glucose response is like through the roof and it's prolonged. It is definitely causing insulin resistance. You know, these, these, uh, you know, these uh, PUFAs uh, and, and furthermore, they make us more hungry. Yeah. Right. So I, but you know, I don't know if I'm going to, I don't, I think I'm too addicted to nuts to ever let them go completely. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was thinking about the is, is is a seasonal food that also require a tremendous amount of work to get access to, and so I think that I try to eat a lot of seasonal stuff. And here it's like pecans are seasonal, very very short window, but it is like to get the pecan out of the shell requires a tremendous amount of work if you're not using a massive machinery. And this is another thing of like I don't know. I think about earning the food. And eating it when nature tells me that I should eat it. And so that makes sense when it's in full. Do you think it's the PUFA? Do you think it's the omega-6, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio? Or do you think and do you think it's the uh way that they are oxidized, you know, and the way that we um uh, we get these oils, right? Uh, how they get these oils out of the soybean and the safflower and the rapeseed. Do you think the major issue is I, I think it's the processing. You know, but I, uh, I think it is the actual total amount of omega six. I think that so Kate Shanahan, amazing work, obviously, but she, for example, promotes 
Uh, I think it's grapeseed oil if it's cold pressed, which is ridiculous, um, in, in my opinion. And she she has a lot of great stuff, in it, but she's like she's honed in specifically on the processing. It's like if it's cold pressed or not with high heat, then it's totally fine. And I don't agree with that at all. I think I think large amounts, raw amounts of omega six matter. Processing also matters on top of that. And so I think they both matter. Like, I don't think it's just one or the other. Uh, but yeah, I mean, of course, like if it's processed and high amount and you're frying it over and over and over again, basically any fried food at a fast food restaurant, that's going to be the worst, 100%. And like there's an overwhelming amount of data that shows that. Okay. So you're generally healthy, you're active. If I'm like, I don't know, I make a salad and I put a tiny bit of cold pressed, you know, or I don't, I don't, I use, you know, olive oil. What does Anthony say? I, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of salads to begin with. So I think that that's something. Whatever, but, fruit salad. I don't yeah. know. Whatever, man. Uh, got peppers and cucumbers and tomato. I don't know. You know, what is it? So I'm, at, I'm at the phase of this journey where I'm like very strict avoidance of everything. I was at a point uh, five years ago where I wouldn't touch carbohydrate either. So who knows where I'll land. No, I'm just, I'm just curious now. where you're. So it's like, you wouldn't need yeah. it. So yeah, right now. I what about olive very, oil? Olive oil, if the source is good, it's just the same thing you're talking about with avocado oil. Like yeah. finding a good source is very challenging. And I, I mean, I saw a study where the, the variance of linoleic acid in olive oil went from nine to 54%. Yeah. Was yeah. it like not even close to the same things? Right. So like, uh, do you think the, if it's true extra virgin olive oil certified, you know? Well, well even that, like I, who knows where, like how that's processed, how long it's been on shit, like when, on the when shelf. it was processed, mm -hmm. what yep. type of olive was it? When was it from when it was picked to when it was processed? Was it sitting there oxidizing the sun for 45 days? Like there's so many things. And that's why one of the things that we're trying to bring is transparency to fat. And so everything that we're going to release has a QR code where you can scan it and see at the time of bottling things are going to change obviously with light and heat and time, but the time of bottling, like here is our fatty acid profile, hundred percent verified third party, which I think is very important to do. So people understand what's going on because no one does this in avocado and olive oil. Yeah. And, yeah I mean, uh, avocado but oil. There is a crafty certification percent. process to at least make sure that it is avocado and olive, which is it's not as rigorous as what you're talking about. It, there's one for avocado oil. There, there is. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, but the problem is everybody's cutting it. Yeah. I mean, so, Selena Wang is a researcher at UC Davis that did amazing work showing that 82% of all avocado oils that they tested were either not all avocado oil at all or partially seed oil. Yeah. 82%. 82%. Insane. <laughs> Chosen Foods was the best she tested. I don't know what brand you use, but Kirkland or Chosen. Yeah. Kirkland verifies occasionally. So their manufacturers are pretty, you know, uh, Kirkland or Chosen. That's what I would, I mean, I got no stock in Costco. So this is just, you know. <laughs> anyway, listen, this has been awesome, man. I appreciate your time. Uh, it's nice to meet somebody. I've seen you, I've seen your work. Uh, an entrepreneur, somebody who's interested in uh, learning, somebody who's interested in, you know, kind of growing the field. And all I can say is keep doing what you're doing. Um, and uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you for, for coming here, sharing your story and, uh, you know, keep fighting the fight. Amy, you got anything? Well, well thank you so much. It's been really interesting. Yeah, thanks to both of you. Appreciate it, guys.